I considered the book to be beautiful and touching. It's too well done to appeal to someone's prurient interest alone. Do you consider the book to be beyond the customary limits of candor by contemporary community standards? Certainly not. In fact, it's relatively mild by today's standards. When you consider that motion pictures and stage plays offer nudity, copulation, oral genital love, masturbation, homosexuality, lesbianism, community standards have radically changed. Your witness, Mr. Duncan. Mr. Sanford, I have before me news clippings from the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal, which note the shaky financial position of Sanford House in the last two years. Are these news accounts substantially true? Yes. In short, since you took over Sanford House, Maggie Russell. it has she not shared as well right away. as it has in the past. She's She's sure. Sure. That she depends on, on what you mean by doing well. Uh, it is true that the uh, firm's book sales uh, have gone down. Perhaps you were desperate enough to ignore your father's previous good taste and tried to save your position in the firm by publishing an obscene book. What's going on? I've made a real mess of everything. Uncle Frank heard from Yerkes that we were seeing each other. Apparently he's known of our relationship for some time, but my rising to your defense over Jerry's well-being flipped him out. He told me to pack up and leave. He took my key and waited until I was outside on the front drive before slamming the door. So I lugged my things over here from across the street. And the postcard from Cassie McGraw still in his desk. I'm sorry. Now, you had to give up your key, right? The key to the front door, yes. But not the one to the rear service porch. Then we're just gonna have to sweat him out. Because I gotta get my hands in that postcard. Mike, my bag! Wait, the light went out. There's Uncle Frank coming out the door. you doing in my driveway? You could have got us both killed. Uh, look, sir, I'm sorry. I came by to see Miss Russell. Well, Miss Russell doesn't live here anymore. Now, you get your lousy crate out of my driveway. You ought to put guys like you away. You son of a bitch. What the hell are you doing here? Spying on me and my son? Come on, get out of the car and say something, you bastard. You're not in court now. Oh, I'd really like to clobber you. But you're not suckering me into that. Now, you get your ass out of here. If you're still snooping around after I've parked my car, I'm gonna kick the living hell out of you. Then I'll turn you over to the cops for prowling. How does that grab you? Call. Let's get the hell out of here before I get my ass kicked. Well? It's beautiful. Cassie McGraw backs up in court what she says in this postcard. 
the defense finally has a star witness. Oh. Now, where can I take you before I catch the next plane to Chicago? Uh, I was hoping you'd take me home. Home? With you? If Jed we were alive today, he'd be all in his late 50s or early 60s. This woman is at least 15 or 20 years older. Like all the old people in this sanitarium. I never think of Katie in terms of years. That reminds me of something. As long as I've been here, and that's going on five years, Katie's been getting flowers. Once a year. Always on her birthday. Who sends Cassie the flowers? I don't know. They're wired from Ryan's Flowers in Oakwood, California. Hello. Hi, Maggie. <gasps> Mike, I was praying it would be you. Have you heard? I mean, about Sherry Moore. She died in her sleep. Yeah. I just finished reading the story. Are things any better in Chicago? It couldn't be worse. Cassie McGraw will never speak on the witness stand. The poor woman's senile. <sighs> what a lousy break. She has moments when she's lucid. Like when she wrote the postcard. But today wasn't one of them. I'm awfully sorry, Mike. All that trouble for nothing. Well, Chicago may not be a total loss. How do you mean? She receives roses every year on her birthday. A standing order from Ryan's Flowers. I call Clay. He's going to check on it first thing tomorrow. Mike, I might be able to help you. When I was working as Frank Griffith's secretary, we dealt exclusively with that florist. So? Why don't you let me get in touch with them? I'd love to help. Miss Cumberland, I'll bet you're wondering why I'm here. Yes, as a matter of fact, I am. Well, the Griffiths have a lot to do with it. I'm terribly concerned about Jerry Griffith. You know the boy who's involved in the obscenity trial? Yes. I watched it on the news last night. It might sound strange to you, but one of my good friends, and I trust him implicitly, is Michael Barrett, the defense attorney in the case. He's a very attractive young man, indeed. He genuinely believes that Jad Ways, the seven minutes, is not obscene. Anyway, he's been racing all over the country trying to find witnesses who knew Jad Way or who had some insight into his motives. He just visited with Cassie McGraw in Chicago. Oh, really? You're familiar with Ryan's flowers? Well, yes. Mike asked me to check their records. Did he? I was surprised to learn that for the past 10 years, you have been paying for Cassie McGraw's birthday flowers. How enterprising of you. How well did you know Cassie McGraw? Cassie McGraw was my private secretary when I lived and worked in Paris, ooh, 35 years ago. At that time, she was my only friend. Very few people know about Cassie, or about any of my life at the time, for that matter. Much of it was not terribly pleasant. Through the years, I've managed to keep it concealed. But why? You know of my long-standing friendship with the Griffiths, especially Frank's late wife. It was always difficult to hide my contempt of his behavior toward his son, Jerry. Now, it's my turn to stand up and be counted. <laughs> It's in the bag. We don't even need the chippies croaking. Elmo can't buy that newspaper and the TV exposure. It also opens up a whole new can of peas. We now have a case of murder one as well. We can anticipate a probability factor of at least 90% for conviction. Who's Jerry's? I think the Griffith name has been muckraked enough. Oh, relax, Frank. It's not your boy that's on trial. It's that obscene book together with that Ben Fremont, that purveyor of filth. The slut's death is just icing on the cake. Frankly, I am more than a little bit concerned at the turn of events. It's a brand new ball game with Sherry Moore's death. Well, if it's any consolation, there's the closing argument Mike dictated about four this morning. Let's pick up on it. it. Might give us a shot in the arm. Supreme Court Justice Douglas once said, the idea of using censors to bar thoughts of sex is dangerous. A person without sex thoughts is abnormal. Sex thoughts may induce sex practices that make for better marital relations. Sex thoughts that make love more attractive certainly should not be outlawed. If the illicit is included, that should make no constitutional difference. 
Your Honor, I call Constance Cumberland to the stand. Please raise your right hand. You solemnly swear to tell the truth and nothing but the truth, so help you God. I do. State your name for the record. Constance Cumberland. Please be seated. Miss Cumberland, what is your present occupation? I'm an actress. I have been an actress for some 35 years. In motion pictures and most recently on television. How do you occupy yourself away from camera? Well, if you mean what organizations do I belong to? I'm a working member of the League for Women Voters, the Reese Davis Center for Emotionally Disturbed Children, and occasionally I've given my public support to the Strength Through Decency League. Because, like anyone else with concern about today's society, I'm against pornography. Mainly because of the way it appeals to the young people who aren't mature enough to understand its implications. Did you ever write and publish any books? I did. Were they works of fiction? Some skeptics probably suggested as much, but I uh, consider my autobiography to be a work of 